Greetings once again, ye fair people of Butler County. <laughs> wow, formal. All right, I can roll with that. <laughs> Our most dedicated fans will notice that we have been gone for a month and a half. Oh, what a glorious month and a half it's been. Well, we're back and ready to bring the best of Butler Community College and El Dorado right to your TV box thing. Details, love it. <laughs> we have Butler alumni playing in the Super Bowl, zombie attacks on campus, what you should have done on Valentine's Day, and a whole lot more. For the next half hour, you should be right here watching the all new Campus, campus Edge. Edge. This is the Campus Edge, and we are your hosts. I'm Michael Montgomery. And I'm Andrea Tate. We have an awful lot to get to you in the next half hour, so we're going to jump right in. There are a bunch of really neat departments here at Butler, and the music department in the Fine Arts Building is no exception. However, it is really easy to confuse one choir from another. To help clear things up, we're going to Zachary Jettle, who's standing by with a nifty piano, and a look at who can and should try out for diversions of a more vocal quality. Hi, I'm Campus Edge reporter Zachary Jettle. If you like making friends and singing, you may want to stay tuned, as today we take an in-depth look at the choirs at Butler County Community College. The Butler Vocal Music Department offers you many opportunities to sing. All students at Butler have the opportunity to audition for the concert choir. Scholarship students who audition for the program fill the small ensembles, which offer more extensive performance opportunities. We sat down with two Butler students to get their thoughts on choir as a whole and their experience here at Butler. I started choir as a preschooler. We had those events where everyone sat on stage. Choir was just always something I liked to go to. No homework. And I never had a lot of friends in choir until I came to Butler. But once I got here, it was just a whole bunch of friends that were like a family. Well, I first started choir when I was in a sixth grade, and that came from whenever I was younger. I used to play violin, and I really, really liked violin. I had an awesome teacher, and she really gave me a passion for music. And from there, uh, she became the choir teacher, too, so I thought I would you know, like to do that, so I went into choir. They're all really nice, and they're all really awesome people, and get a lot of like buddy friends and stuff like that. Like. Uh, I think I enjoy college choir when I went in high school just because everybody that who's in there really wants to be there, like a big family almost, you know, like you, you all, you're all sharing the same feeling when you're up there and you know that you all are and it's it's magical, yeah. It's, uh, it's something that you can't really duplicate anywhere else except up there because, you know, like you know that the people that are there are really enjoying your music, you know, and like you're really sharing something with them and that's a really cool feeling to have. There are multiple choirs and ensembles here at Butler, each with a different style of singing. The one that everybody knows is Headliners, and they're the show choir, and they're very outgoing people, very fun. The next one is the Butler Ladies. Um, they do show choir songs, but it's comprised of only girls, and they have really fun dance moves. Um, there's a cappella, and all their songs are arranged by Mr. Udlin, and they're like the cool hipster group. Everyone loves them. And then there's chamber singers, and we're like the lovable geeks, lovable dorks. We sing the stuff that the audience may find boring, but we love it, so it's okay. So if you can sing and you're thinking about joining, then join. The department's always looking for new voices to add, and who knows, you may even make some new friends. For Campus Edge, I'm Zach. Thanks, Zach. If there is one thing I need, it's more friends. Mm. If singing is not your thing, and I get if it's not. He sings like a drowning donkey. I have great range. Yeah. As I was saying, if singing is not your thing, for whatever reason, another cool thing you can go check out is the Kansas Oil Museum, located right down the street on East Central. To find out more, we go to reporter team Emily Maslow and Matthew Lacey, where I understand the entrance admission is cheap and local history is abound. Emily? Thanks, Zach. If there is one thing I need, it's more friends. Mm. If singing is not your thing, and I get if it's not. He sings like a drowning donkey. I have great range. Yeah. As I was saying, if singing is not your thing, for whatever reason, another cool thing you could go check out is the Kansas Oil Museum, located right down the street on East Central. To find out more, we go to reporter team Emily Maslow and Matthew Lacey, where I understand the entrance admission is cheap and local history is abound. Emily?
Take a moment to think and put yourself in the shoes of oil miners years ago, especially in a small town where oil was such a big deal, a small town like this one. It's hard to believe and really understand everything that citizens in this town went through. It's definitely a story that needs to be told. It's a bit tragic and sad to listen to, but it's important we unleash the secrets that El Dorado has left undiscovered. We had the chance to visit with Renee Albert, the museum educator at the Kansas Oil Museum, to help us learn more about El Dorado's rich history. It started out as a Butler County Historical Society. There were some folks that wanted to preserve Butler County's colorful history. And it just happened that we also had a big oil boom here in the late 1910s, early 1920s. And so it just kind of became the place, this is where it kind of needed to be, to um, celebrate the history of Butler County and the history of the oil boom. And it's also, we're also the county seat, which also plays into our history as well. So we have a, a three-pronged um, mission here to preserve farming, ranching, and oil. And that's kind of what you're seeing, is the farming, ranching, and oil history of Butler County. But when you come in the front door of the gallery, we've tried to set it up kind of like a timeline. So you walk through the Glory of the Hills exhibit that talks to the Flint Hills because we, we sit right in the center of the Flint Hills and Butler County actually has the highest point of the Flint Hills is in Butler County. And then you get into the Native Americans, a little bit about the Native Americans, and then the farming and ranching that got us started. And we talked to the Capricorn, which was a Milo crop that kind of put Butler County on the map. And then you get into the oil, and then you talk, we talk to the science of oil, and the discovery of oil, and the uses of oil, and then you get to go outside and experience an oil boom town. Well, we're here as an educational institution for the community. Um, we also provide entertainment. Um, we're always part of the Frontier Western Days in, in August. We provide an old-fashioned Christmas in December. We try to do things to get the community to come out and have something to do. Um, we offer summer camps in the summertime. We offer outreach to schools or community groups or civic groups. We also offer a lot of the documents that people need. We have a lot of microfilm. We have microfilm that goes back to the 1870s up through today. We have um, city directories and I love looking at the old city directories because you look up you know Joe Schmo in 1920 and it tells you where he lives, what his job is, the name of his wife, you know it so it has a lot of uh, added information that nowadays we Google. The museum also houses traveling exhibits that change throughout the year. We have four of those planned for this year. Um, it was commissioned by the District Court of the State of Kansas to honor the 150th birthday of Kansas in 2011. And so what you're seeing in our lobby is the traveling version of a permanent exhibit that is in Kansas City, Kansas in the Bob Dole Room at the District Court up there. And this speaks to the immigration and, and the, the kind of the ebb and flow of it in Kansas since the 1860s and 70s. Our ticket prices are very economical. Our adult admission is $4. And that's anyone that's eight, over 18. It's 19 and up. Until you get to 65. And then if you are 65, then it's $3. And our students, I love the fact that our student prices are age 6 to 18. So $2 for anyone from the ages of 6 to 18 to come in and, and visit the museum. And anyone 5 and younger is free. It's a fun place to come. <laughs> I'm Emily Maslow, and this has been your Campus Edge Inside the Oil Museum. Thanks, Emily. It looks like a cool place to check out. Now, when you've had a winter as crazy as this one, it's ideal to find nice indoor ways to spend your time. Unfortunately, the only way to get from one nice indoor place to the next is to hop in your car and drive. I know what you're thinking. How can I get my car ready for driving in such conditions? I'm glad you asked. Mitchell Toon is standing by to answer just that question. Mitch? Hey, this is Mitchell Toon with the Campus Edge, showing you how to winterize your vehicle for the cold winter season that we're suffering from. 
The oil in your engine changes depending on how hot and cold the engine is running. Because the outside temperatures will influence the internal temperature of your engine, you will need to make sure you are using the proper oil for the conditions. During the winter months, if you live where temperatures get below freezing, you'll want to switch over to a thinner, less viscous oil. Your car's coolant system is not intended only to keep your engine from overheating. It is also responsible for protecting your valuable engine against corrosion. Before the weather gets too cold, make sure you're using coolant with ethylene glycol to protect your engine. Every vehicle requires a certain ratio of coolant to water, and your owner's manual and repair technician can explain what your engine needs. For most vehicles, a winter ratio is 60% coolant to 40% water. Checking the windshield wipers and the windshield wiper fluid is also a necessary step in winterizing your vehicle. When behind a large truck, who is spitting up snow on the windshield, you'll know how important it is to have windshield wipers and fluid. It is also wise to keep a set of jumper cables with you at all times in case of emergency. If you don't already have an emergency kit in your car, consider putting together a few basics and stowing them in your car. Naturally, you'll want to be sure your spare tire is in good shape with all the tools and etc but you might also want a few other emergency items in case you slide off the road. Necessary things to have would be a flashlight, some gloves, a lighter that could be used for warmth, and of course a working radio just in case of other winter emergencies and be sure to always tune in to 88.1 KBTL The Grizz. Now it's time to start her up and be on your way. This is Mitchell Toon with the Campus Edge. That's all for now. Back to you in the studio. Indeed, 88.1 The Grizz is the only radio station to listen to when driving around El Dorado. When we come back, it's all about entertainment. We'll go back in video game time and catch a review of The Lone Survivor. He knew he didn't have to be another number. Butler gave Brett the power to retrain as an individual. So, at 44, Brett found the power of personal attention, small class size, and an education at half the cost. For Brett, those are the sort of numbers that kept him from becoming one. Brett found a fresh start at 44. He discovered his power at Butler. How will power change you? Cameron's Barbershop Quartet sang their way to eight in the world while singing the praises of one powerful education. He's found the power to record three CDs and write more than 120 songs, including the one song inspired by his time at Butler, playing in the background now. All this personalized to around 14 in each class, that's much better than sitting in the 23rd row of a 600-seat auditorium. Cameron found his passion in music. He discovered his power at Butler. How will Thanks, guys. It looks pretty good. I, however, prefer gaming over movie watching, and Thomas Hayes appears to agree with me. He is standing by with his second installment in his history of video games. So put your time travel hat on and get ready. Campus Edge reporter here, Thomas Hayes. And in my previous segment, we looked at the origin of home video game consoles, starting with the Magnavox Odyssey. But now, it is time for the next stage. Though it was not the first of its kind, it was certainly the most popular at the time. This was the Atari 2600 video computer system released in 1977. The Atari had many more functions that the Odyssey lacked. First and foremost, it had a joystick, which allowed for precise movement. It also had several switches that could change the color from black and white to color, the game mode, and the game difficulty. To this day, this is one of the few consoles that actually have these functions right on the console. But most certainly the most evident improvement was the graphics and sound. Rather than overlays on the screen, the image is visibly projected on the screen with the pixels. The Atari perfected what the Odyssey imagined. Now there is this so-called world with characters, environments, and even sound effects. But the best way to really explain this console is to actually play one yourself. Who else? Have you played Atari today? My favorite game was Freeway. Wow.
Why was it your favorite game? Because I like the chicken. The Atari was truly made for children. They are performing and directing simultaneously in their everyday lives. These are pretty easy. Yeah, they are pretty easy. I'm going to play it again. You'll play it again? Mm -hmm. Play away. With Atari being in the lead of this industry, there seemed to be nothing that could stop them in their way. Well, not until the video game crash of 1983. There are conflicts that developed within Atari that caused some of their top game developers to leave. For example, Howard Warshaw, one of the best game developers at the time, was only given five weeks to create E.T. the Extraterrestrial. This meant to go entirely from outlines to a finished product, a crude amount of time. The game is often noted to be the reason for the video game crash entirely. Some of these developers left to form a little group called Activision. Activision is still active today and continues to lead the modern industry. Like the Odyssey, its title reflects its impact. Atari, deriving from a Japanese verb meaning to hit the target. And that's exactly what they did. The target that Atari had hit was the home video game market. The crash was a sign that video games are now an established technology, rather than just an idea. In my next series, we will look at the next stage of gaming with the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is Thomas Hayes. Awesome job, Thomas. I'm looking forward to it. You know what I was looking forward to? The Super Bowl. We all saw how that worked out. Yeah, as I understand it, only one team bothered to show up. <laughs> what you may not know is there was a Butler football alum playing in the game. Right. Jeremy Mincy graduated from Butler back in 2003, and this year helped bring the Denver Broncos to the Super Bowl as a defensive end. Nicole Fye brushed up on his life story and talked to Butler head coach Troy Morrill at his time at Butler. Nicole? Super Bowl 48 saw many successes, but none as important to the small town of El Dorado as that of former Grizzly defensive end Jeremy Mincy. Mincy, who was a part of the 2002 to 2003 seasons and the 2003 National Championship team, was signed by the Denver Broncos on December 14th to fill a hole in the team's secondary for the remaining four games and the postseason. Recruited personally by head coach Troy Morrill, Mincy came from Statesboro High School, an extremely disciplined high school out of Statesboro, Georgia. At Butler, Mincy was the captain his sophomore year, earning first team all-conference and a number 18 rank on Rivals.com's non-high school player in the nation. He was a captain. Teammates, and I think that speaks a lot about his character, type of person, work ethic, and all that he possessed. After Butler, Minty committed to his dream school, becoming a Gator at the University of Florida, where he found success under head coaches Ron Zook and Urban Meyer, eventually earning captain his senior year. Minty was second team All SEC in 2005 and recorded 62 tackles, 10 and a half for loss while starting all 24 games of an NCAA career. In the 2006 draft, Mincy was the 22nd pick in the 6th round and the 191st overall pick to the New England Patriots. He would later become a part of the San Francisco 49ers from the Patriots practice squad and then be signed by the Jacksonville Jaguars until his release in 2013. Uh, his work ethic was just unbelievable as, as far as uh, his energy that he brought every day to practice and you know, the weight room, off-season program, all those kind of things. So, Seeing him, you know, grow mature here because he was, you know, he came in, he had a new frame, he was kind of skinny, and you know, being able to put on the weight, and strength, and, and still be able to move as good as he could. After being released by the Jaguars, a team that started out 0 and 8, Mincy was picked up by the Denver Broncos, a team who would be the 15 and 4 AFC champions after a loss in the Super Bowl. Mincy is in his eighth year in the NFL and is one of six Grizzlies currently performing on the professional football stage. But no matter the success, Mincy will always be a part of the Butler football family. This has been Nicole Five for the Campus Edge, signing off. Awesome, Nicole. Thanks. We'll have to keep an eye out for him next season. Now, it's time for another break, so when we come back, it's all about how-tos, both a good date and a zombie attack. Well, you'll want to see this. It's real simple. At Butler Community College, you take home more than a diploma. You're getting up close and personal with a college experience that fits your needs. It's powerful being a grizzly. Be honest with your future.
We know real education. At Butler Community College, we know our students make real sacrifices to turn their dreams into reality. But realizing your dreams shouldn't bankrupt your future. Get a powerful education at half the cost. Be honest with your future. Real value is quality education and hands-on training that gives you choices and transfers when you're ready. With real instructors who know you're not just a student ID. That's the real power of Butler Community College. Be honest with your future. Real power is getting a front row seat to the action-packed world of energizing your skills for a real career and learning from instructors who really know your name. We know you're ready to get real. Be honest with your future. Welcome back. We're on the home stretch. Valentine's Day has come and gone, but I think it's safe to say it was better for some. <laughs> Fear not, my little Padawan. You will not be alone forever. No, but you might be if you don't follow these tips for your very own Miss Andrea Tate. Hi, honey. Hi. What you doing? I'm playing Halo. Da, don't you remember what today is? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. It's not my birthday. It's, your birthday. it's not Happy my birthday. birthday. I forgot your birthday. It's I'm not sorry. my birthday. It's okay. the holiday to do with the way you feel about me. Christmas was last month. That's, it's not Christmas. I don't need to give you any presents. It's not Christmas. Christmas was last month. I know this. It's the holiday to do with love, where you show that person that you just care about them. And usually, you know, the boy takes the girl out on a date and, like, to dinner and to, like, a <coughs> movie and buys her a gift. And I can see I'm getting nowhere you can, with you. You can uh, log in. You can join if you want to. There's, there's an open slot. Every year, thousands of men suffer. From forgetting Valentine's Day. It's an awful symptom and there is no cure, but there is a way to fix it. Follow me now as I recreate the Valentine's Day date that should have happened. more than one place on Valentine's Day. It's a special occasion, so show her that not only are you romantic, but you also have a fun side, too.
Almost I could feel you sweat I kiss you on the neck And you got wet It's a shallow treat For a guy like me Everybody's looking at you Like they want to Like they want to go home with you Everybody's looking at you Like they want to Everybody's looking at you Like they want to Everybody's looking at you Like they want to like they want to go home with you I've got nothing keeping me here I've wasted all the love that I hold dear I'll throw a dart LA The wolf has run away The guy you know thinks he's so slick He'll kiss you on the lips but he'll get sick The Thario, he's a creep you know I did smile! That was my smile! <laughs> this is how I show happiness! Oh, they're just so cute together. <laughs> Couples are not always cute though. Especially when one of them is a zombie. What would you do if you are walking to class one day and you see we are overrun? Cadre Smith is here to help you out with a practical guide to the zombie apocalypse. Cadre? Hey little girl, how are you? Oh, I'm pretty good, thanks. <laughs> My day has been pretty going well, I guess. I mean, I had biology and... The zombie apocalypse. It will happen when you least expect it. Campus Edge reporter Cadre Smith will show you survival tips on how to survive at Butler Community College. Campus says rule number one, find a weapon. You, sir, what is your weapon going to be? I like to kill him with kindness. How do you kill something with kindness? It's easy. Uh, uh, like this. I'm killing you with kindness. He obviously has died. The weapon you should use during a zombie apocalypse is a crowbar. A crowbar is a strong weapon. It can be used to make silent kills and is also able to pry open doors and anything else you can't get into. Rule number two of the zombie apocalypse. Finding a good place to hide. Over. You, sir, where are you hiding? In a dumpster. Okay. Side note. Know your surroundings before you start hiding. The best place to hide on campus during a zombie apocalypse would be the Educare building, since already 90% of the building is blocked off in preparation for the inevitable zombie invasion. <laughs> during a zombie apocalypse, if you try to go out to get food, there is a risk of getting bit. What do you do if you're trapped in a single area and you have no way to get out? This might be gross, but it would work. Tip number three, camouflage. Camouflage using the guts and blood of the zombie make you smell like the zombie, and so they can't tell the difference. So they don't attack you. So remember students at Butler Community College, be smart during the zombie apocalypse. Stop it, stop. No. This is Bukhari Smith with the Campus Edge. If only it were that easy. I know, right? <laughs> That's all we have for this week. We explored the vocal music department, winterized our vehicles, and found out how Butler was represented at the Super Bowl. Plus, we looked into the history of both Butler County and video games. We'll see you again in two weeks with a brand new episode and a couple new faces sitting here where we are now. In the meantime, check out the reruns of this show weekdays at 11 a.m. or last semester's show at 6.30 p.m. on BCTV Channel 20. Or you can check them all out along with the behind-the-scenes fun on our YouTube channel, Butler Radio and TV. <laughs> so, we'll see you again next time. This has been, and will always be, The, the Campus, Campus Edge. Edge. <laughs>